Well, good morning, Foothills family. Uh, we're taking a break from our Proverbs study. By the way, thank you for joining our Wednesday morning Bible study. Uh, we're just starting a, kind of a new study on, on the Bible and different ways to do certain things within the scriptures. Uh, and what I wanna do right now, I wanna go into uh, basically why the Bible is relevant. We started this last week. We started going over this. We started looking at different concepts, uh, why we should read the Bible, why we should study the scriptures. Uh, and this week, I want to take it a step further uh, than we did last week and, and really begin to examine uh, why it's important to read the Bible and furthermore, how we can do this uh, in, a, in a culture that really has no respect or no regard uh, for ultimate truth. As we mentioned in the sermon this past week, I, I touched on it briefly, but we're facing a theological problem uh, in our culture. It's not political, uh, as many people would say, but it is theological and it, it goes down to uh, worldview, the way people view the world, and even Christians at times, we can begin to view the world more or less uh, through the lens of politics uh, than we can the Bible. So it's important that as believers, we set the tone, uh, and especially within the church, that everything that we're looking at in culture, uh, even with our, in our con conversations with friends, with family, uh, that we're doing this and we're filtering everything that we say and everything that we look at through the lens uh, of a biblical worldview. Uh, by the way, just so you know, the, the, the headphones I have on, we've been having some uh, technical difficulties with sound, and I was told this might help to improve uh, the live stream, so we're, we're still tweaking things, uh, but that's why I have headphones on uh, this morning, just if you were, if you're wondering. I did not send any sermon notes out today because today's uh, lesson, today's Bible study is more or less going to be practical, and it's going to be a little bit historical as we look at some things. Now, I will have scripture. I will be touching on some scriptures, but there's not going to be that many. Uh, so again, uh, have your Bibles available. You can mark these. Uh, have a pen and paper available. Uh, you can write these things down and go back to the points uh, that are mentioned after the study is over. Uh, but again, I just feel this is very important. Uh, we talk about reading the Bible in church. We talk about uh, admonishing and edifying Christians to do a daily study in the Word of God. Uh, but at times we fail at this, and, and I believe the reason we do this is because we fail to see the importance in really sticking and in, in reading the Word of God each and every day. Again, if we're not in the Word of God, it's impossible to have a biblical worldview. It's impossible to have the mind of Christ, uh, and it's utterly impossible to look at the things that we're seeing in our world today, uh, the rioting, the craziness, uh, the back-and-forth political views, and rightly interpret these things uh, in the light of God's Word. Uh, we should not look at the, the lost world as believers and be surprised when lost people act like lost people. Again, if we're filtering everything through the biblical worldview, this should create compassion within us to see that there are those that do not hold to God's standards and more, more than that, don't have a regenerated heart to where they can understand God's standards. Uh, we say many times that we should pray uh, for our nation, for our world, for the things that are going on. And, and I hear many Christians uh, plead to God for God to change things. But the more we think about this, I pray that every time we, we let a thought like that come into our mind, never, never enter into prayer unless you are ready to be the answer to that prayer. Because God uses His people uh, to bring about His purposes. And, and let us never mindlessly pray to God, 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 please bring a, take away these evils in the world. God, please save my next door neighbor. God, please save my family member, if we're, not, if we're not available to God, if we are not willing and able to be a part of that prayer, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the way we're speaking with God. Again, many times, and, and I would say very many times, God uses His people to answer prayers. So again, let's be the answer to those prayers and, and let's do that through the lens of the Bible, not through culture, and not through secular humanism as we're seeing today, not, not through, through a postmodern mindset of the church, but everything we do, even operating uh, within the church, how we do church, uh, how we do the, the ecclesiology, the structure of the church, let that be governed and guided by Scripture. If we say we're people of the Word of God, if we say that we hold high everything written in the Word of God, uh, let us not be proved false in our actions by adhering to a cultural Christianity. So again, this morning, uh, I want to continue on the thread line of looking uh, at why it's important to study the Bible. We began this last week. Uh, Today is going to be a bit more practical uh, and also, like I said earlier, historical. But I hope to give some answers 
uh, and maybe some guidance to those who are, are, are confronting people or being confronted in their life by those who do not have a biblical worldview. Uh, before we embark on this study this morning, let's bow our heads and open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that uh, we have together. I pray that you would use the scriptures that we have and would use, Lord, just church history uh, to open our minds, Lord, uh, to filter everything through the Word of God. I pray that we are more and more conformed into your image so that we will be useful tools for the glory of God in our culture today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Uh, many times when we enter into culture, and this is with friends, with family members, we're going to experience pushback from those that don't believe in God or rather don't have a view of the Bible that's, that's biblical. Now, most times Christians can be stumped by, by a question, and that is this, why do you believe the Bible? Many people will ask believers why they believe the Bible. Well, there's two, two fundamental or two basic uh, ways that believers will answer this question. And I'm going to share these with you and share, share with you the fallacy in them. When we are asked, why do you believe the Bible? Uh, the first way many Christians will answer this is to say, I believe the Bible because that is how I was raised. My grandmother believed the Bible, my grandfather, my great-great-grandmother. My parents always kept me in church, uh, in a Baptist church with, with, uh, with fundamental Baptist beliefs. And uh, that's why I believe the Bible. Well, here's the fallacy in that. Uh, the Mormon can say the same thing, that they believe what they believe because they were raised that way. The Jehovah's Witness can say the same thing, that they were raised this way because of their parents. So really, really that answer is very relative. It's not objective. It, it's floating, and it's not a defense of why we can truly say we believe the Bible to be authoritative. And I've heard it many times from good-willed Christians that they have questions when they are asked why do you believe the Bible? The ultimate default, because they're caught off guard, is, well, I believe it because that's how I was raised. Well, again, that, that answer doesn't suffice against somebody who does not believe. They may have been raised a different way, and, and how can you combat that when you are your own authority or your upbringing is your own authority? Furthermore, everyone's upbringing is not right. We know that. We know that, that everything that we are taught growing up is not right. Uh, I heard a pastor use the uh, example of his mom uh, when he was young saying that he needed to wear a hat out in the cold because he could catch a virus if he didn't wear a hat because he could get, uh, get sick because of the cold weather. And, and he went to school and learned that uh, you can't absorb a virus through the top of your head and it devastated him, to th devastated him to think that his parents had lied to him about catching a virus that way. So the point is that many things that we learn in our upbringing are not right. Therefore, to default and answer the question, why do you believe the Bible by saying, well, it's how I was brought up, uh, that doesn't hold water against somebody who doesn't believe in the authority of Scripture. The second way many believers will answer the question of how or why do you believe in the Bible uh, is they will default to say, well, I believe it because of my experience. Now, I read the Bible and Jesus changed my life. Jesus made my life so much better, and He could do the same for you. Well, here's the problem in this as well. Again, the Mormon and the Jehovah's Witness or the Buddhist could say the exact same thing about their experience. Well, I experienced Buddhism, and it changed my life. The teachings in that changed the way I view things. Uh, so really, that answer doesn't suffice either. Uh, think about this. John Smith uh, claims that he had an experience that changed his life. He, he claims that an angel from the Lord came and gave him new revelation, uh, and therefore because of this experience that changed his life, he went on to write the Book of Mormon. So to say that you've had an experience that changed your life, that may be well and good, and yes, for believers, that is true that Christ does change our life. But when we are talking to a secular, unbelieving world that asks that question, to default and say, well, I believe Christianity because it changed my life. Uh, that, that doesn't hold any water either because, again, your answer to somebody who doesn't believe is subjective. It's ever-changing. It holds no weight. So why do we believe the Bible? Well, in the brief time we have together, I just want to look at some things that may help us. Why do we believe that God's Word is authoritative over anything else? 
And we're going to look at these things very quickly. To, to sum it up, I've got a passage of Scripture. If you have your Bible, uh, you can open this morning to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. Uh, again, if you have your Bible, open to 1 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. Uh, and this is basically the verse that we're going to be pulling from this morning in our time together because it's an apologetic defense of why we believe the Bible. If you're ever asked that question, why you believe the Bible, uh, this portion of, of 1 Peter is a great answer. And Peter lays this out. So again, 1 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. Let me read this for us. Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came, uh, excuse me, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love, whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the, sac on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through human, uh, prophets though human, excuse me, spoke from God as though they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So first of all, and this is a lot, lot in that verse right there, a lot in that passage that we could, we could unpack for a long time. But first of all, we see this, that the Bible is a collection of historical documents. The Bible is a collection of historical documents. So again, if you, you have a pen or paper, you're taking notes, and someone approaches you and asks why you believe the Bible, these are some things that you can come back with uh, that you can actually prove to them verifiably rather than saying, this is my opinion, I was raised this way, or this is my experience. Again, we we covered these opening up. They don't hold water to the unbeliever. But here are some things that are objectively true uh, that we can lay out. So number one, the Bible is a collection of historical documents. Sixty-six books of the Bible were written. Forty different authors, actually over 40 different authors, written over a span of 1,500 years. So that gives you the, the depth and breadth of the Bible, written in three languages, Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. So this shows you over a span of 1,500 years, over 40 different authors on three different continents and three different languages. The Bible was compiled over this time. Most of these authors, by the way, never met each other because they didn't live in the same lifetime. But everything in the Word of God lines up consistently. There are no inconsistencies in this. So the Bible is a collection of historical documents filled with real names, real events that took place in history. And we're going to see this uh, in just a bit as we keep going. Also in the Bible, there are various writing styles that these 40, over 40 different authors wrote in various writing styles. Uh, just a few of them, you've got the epistles, such as Paul uh, and John. These are letters to the church. You've got genealogies, historical genealogies that record lineages of families, uh, that of David leading to Christ and Adam leading to Christ, but one of the most important we see in Matthew, uh, Genesis, many of these genealogies. Uh, also the law, the Leviticus and Numbers, we see this, wisdom literature, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, this is the wisdom literature, and also prophecy. We see prophecy in the Bible in the Old Testament and in Revelation as well. This is the foretelling of events to come. Also, I will note this, that there have been throughout history thus far 2,300 archaeological, let me back up right there, 23,000 archaeological digs related to the historical accuracy of the Bible. And you can research this on your own, but not one of these 23,000 digs has ever been able to refute the Bible in any way. It only supports uh, what has been said in the Word of God. Now, I want to show you one of these historical accounts when we're talking about the Bible being a historical documentation 
uh, of 66 books over 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages, and all of this comes together. Uh, let me read you this portion from the beginning of the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Now, now just to set the stage, Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus. We don't know much about Theophilus. Some have said he may have been a Roman leader at the time. He may have been in, in the government system some way. Uh, but Luke is writing the Gospel of Luke to Theophilus. The whole Gospel of Luke is written to one man, Theophilus. And, and I, want to, I want you to see at the, the outset uh, the Gospel of Luke. Luke states why he's writing the Gospel of Luke. This is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the beginning who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seems fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. That's important. Again, he's writing to Theophilus saying it's important that I write these events out in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Why is he doing this? Well, verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that have been taught. So again, Luke is giving an apologetic defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Lordship of Christ by laying things out, by laying the events that happened out in consecutive order. Luke was a, a doctor and Luke was a historian as well. So he didn't deal in half-truths or speculation. Luke was very analytical uh, in what he did and what he recorded and he wanted to be precise in the truth. So again, we see in the Gospel of Luke, this is a historical documentation written to a real person in history, Theophilus. And again, we don't have the information on really who he was. But Luke is writing this account, and you can see in verse 2 again, this was passed down as well, Luke says, by eyewitnesses. So Luke is in compiling an account of eyewitnesses and people that were in history, through history, that actually can back up what is being said here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 is a great example of this. And it merely says this, Paul writes, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. It's very interesting that, that Alexander the coppersmith is mentioned here and not much else. Why is that? Well, because he was a real person at a real point in history that Paul is basically making reference to. It's almost as if he's to say, uh, hey, you, you guys know uh, in Ephesus church, you know Alexander the coppersmith down the street, which everyone in Ephesus would probably know. Well, this guy is an opponent of the gospel and did us great harm. So you can see even in the epistles, they're being written in a manner that is just, just common to, to point to real people throughout history. Number two, the Bible recorded was recorded by eyewitnesses. We just read that in the Gospel of Luke. The Bible was recorded by eyewitnesses. So why do I believe the Bible? Well, number one, it's full of historical events and facts and it's a historical document, rather it's 66 historical documents written by over 40 different authors in three different languages and on three different continents. So that's number one, I believe the Bible because these verifiable facts. Number two, I believe the Bible because it was written and recorded by eyewitnesses. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says this, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. And it's hard to verify a story if you don't have eyewitnesses. Um, the prison system works this way. The justice system in our world today. If, if we're going to go to court, uh, it's, it's a pretty good fact that you're not going to, uh, to win your case. If you are defending yourself and you have no eyewitnesses to verify uh, your innocence. I think of, uh, of my own kids. You know, many times uh, they'll, they'll be arguing. Uh, yes, pastor's kids do argue at times, just, just a little bit. But they'll be arguing and, and fussing with each other upstairs, and we will call them down and ask about what happened, trying to figure out who's to blame for starting the fight. Well, if their other brothers or sister were not present and it was only one-on-one, -on -one, 
there's a lot of finger pointing going on and it's really hard to get the true story of what actually happened. Things can be fabricated, things can be made up uh, in order to defend one's case. But when you have eyewitnesses, when you have others that are co collaborating and cooperating in telling you what actually happened, it's a different story altogether. The biblical eyewitnesses lived in the time of Christ. Uh, look, we're going to look at 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul writes this. And you can tell in, in what Paul writes, he's giving a, a little bit of a, a defense of the faith here. Paul writes, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. Now here he is giving his list of eyewitnesses. It's almost as if Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, here's some eyewitnesses that you can go to. And by the way, at the time of, of Paul writing this, these eyewitnesses were around. You could go to these people. So it's almost as Paul is writing and saying, listen, the, this happened in this way, and if you don't take my word for it, here's some people you can verify this with. Paul goes on to say uh, that he appeared to Cephas, this is after the resurrection, and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers or sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one untimely born. Now, the eyewitnesses listed uh, would have been people you wanted to talk to. 500 people were listed. And Paul says, if you don't believe Peter, if you don't believe the 12 disciples that I've already cited, then you can go to 500 others that I can point you to. Most of them are still alive. Some have died, but most of them, those that are alive, can testify that these things are true. And then Paul goes on to list James. And in our study of James, we pointed out why this is such a, a credible eyewitness. James was the brother, the half-brother of Christ. And if you read the Gospels, you know that before the resurrection, uh, the family of Christ, his brothers, his sisters, did not believe him to be divine in nature, did not believe to him to, to be God, uh, did not believe anything that he was saying about himself as being the Son of God. Uh, so James was a denier of his own brother being Lord until the resurrection. And Paul says here, if, if you don't believe the, the 500 or probably around 300 witnesses because some had died, if you don't believe these people, go to James. You know that he was the brother of Christ, and most people probably were aware that James did not believe his own brother was God. But things have changed. And Paul says, go to this eyewitness of James. And, and then Paul says, lastly, uh, myself, I am a witness. And Paul was known as a persecutor of the church, as one who was, was studious, was well-known uh, as uh, in the rabbinic community. Com community. Uh, he was very revered, and he, he gave all of that notoriety away for following Christ and living a life of persecution. If what Paul said, if his testimony of Jesus Christ was not true, why would he venture into a life of persecution? Now, he actually experienced something. He experienced the Lord on the road to Damascus when God came in Acts chapter 9, and, and Jesus proverbially knocked him off of his horse and said, Now you're serving me. Get up, follow me. So Paul, again, saying, if you don't believe any of these witnesses, look at the change that has taken place in my life. And now I am following Christ with everything that I have. So there are more objections uh, in the Bible. And, and when we fall on these truths to say it's historical and we can, we can point to eyewitnesses, there, there will even be objections in this. And I just want to look at this briefly. Uh, some will say uh, this, especially many uh, college professors will fall back on this argumentation against the truth and the authority of the Bible. And they'll say, well, you know, the translations are inaccurate. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before. The Bible translations are inaccurate. And an example I've heard from a college professor is using that of the, the telephone game. You know, you, you start with a message in the front of the line and you whisper it to somebody and they whisper it to the next person and it goes on and on and on. And by the time it reaches the end of the line, the message is not at all 
the same message that was in the beginning. So many, many secular professors will say, well, the, the translations are, are not proper. But this would only be true if the translations were, were translations of translations. What, what I mean by that is whenever we go into making a Bible translation of any kind, you don't go to the most recent translation to make a translation of that translation. Every Bible that has been translated goes back to the original languages of the Bible, the Greek, the Aramaic, and they go back to the original manuscript of the Bible uh, to look at this. So the, the translations are, are translations of, of almost original copies of the Bible. Now another thing I want to look at very briefly is, is the, the validity of the translations that we have. Now I want to point this out. Just alone, the New Testament has, and I want you to hear this, over 6,000 manuscripts. The New Testament has over 6,000 manuscripts of the original copies of the New Testament. And that's not even counting the Old Testament. If we counted the Old Testament, uh, some have said we would have um, close to maybe 20,000 copies of the whole canon of Scripture. But alone, the New Testament has 6,000 close to original, original copies uh, of the New Testament. Okay, Julius Caesar his Gallic Wars, and really that's the only way we know anything about Julius Caesar. There are less than 12 original manuscripts of that, but nobody questions the existence of Julius Caesar. We can go on from that. Aristotle, all we know of Aristotle is his poetics, his book Poetics. Of Aristotle's writings, the Poetics, we only have 10 copies of those in existence. The writings of Socrates, and you've heard of Socrates, the great philosopher. How many writings of Socrates do we have in our world today? Zero. The only way we know anything about Socrates is through the writings of Plato, but nobody questions these men or their existence or anything. So they have less than 20 copies, these men, of anything that they ever wrote, and no one questions it. We have 6,000 original manuscripts of the New Testament. Yet it is very much questioned. The earliest manuscript of the Bible, of the New Testament that we have, the, the earliest one we can find, was written in 120 A.D. Now that's two decades, two decades after Christ and His resurrection. Now some people may say, I got you. Two decades. The closest thing you have to original manuscripts of the Bible is two decades away. Well, that's right. But these other writings that I have mentioned, if you look at Plato, Socrates, which we have nothing of, or, or any of the other men that we mentioned, Julius Caesar, the closest original manuscript that was found in existence for any of these men was a thousand plus years away from the resurrection. So you got these historical documents that nobody questions that are a thousand plus years away from the resurrection of Christ, and then you have the New Testament, which was 20 years away. So... The Bible is a collection of historical documents, and we have more, more, more ability to, 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 to lean on their validity than anything else that we have in history. You could go on to Homer's Odyssey and, and look at that as well, and it's the same thing. The years don't match up uh, with, with that of the Bible, with the validity that we have in Scripture. Uh, number three, number three, the Bible is supernatural in origin. The Bible is supernatural in origin. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 14 through 18, and this is the Old Testament, okay, hundreds of years before the New Testament is written. This is what the psalmist wrote. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot sherd. My tongue sticks to my jaw, and you lay me in dust of the earth. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. Now what is this description that the psalmist is writing about? Well, believers know that this is speaking of the crucifixion. The interesting thing about this is the psalmist that wrote this wrote about something that he knew nothing about because crucifixion did not yet exist in history. So he is prophesying, he is writing about an event, the crucifixion of Christ, that will take place hundreds of years later, 
And by the way, crucifixion, this art of, of executing someone, was not in existence yet. So again, the Bible is supernatural in nature and everything that is written. The prophecies can line up and, and, and the, the, the line, the, the historical accuracy of the dates of when the Psalms were written in the Old Testament can be verified from that of the New Testament. And we can see that things are predicted, prophesied, that were not even in existence or even talked about as of yet. So the Bible, again, is supernatural in nature. Uh, for, for time's sake, that's, that's just one uh, of these kind of events that we can point to, these writings, but there are very many. The whole Old Testament points uh, to the fulfillment of the New Testament. Now, here's another argument that, that I want to touch on. It's one that I've heard quite a bit, and again, especially in many colleges and schools. They will argue that the scientific method is needed to believe any kind of truth, and they'll say, I need the scientific method to believe in God. I need science to prove this. Have you heard this maybe from friends, from family, that science is the ultimate truth and if we don't have scientific evidence of the resurrection of Christ, uh, then we cannot believe this. This is what many people will say. Well, there's a problem with, with this line of argumentation. Uh, the scientific method in its nature has to do with something that is observable and repeatable. The, the scientific method must be observable and repeatable. You cannot observe history and you cannot repeat history exactly as it was. Uh, here's an example of this. You cannot go back and observe George Washington being the first president of the United States. There's no way to observe that. You can't go back and observe uh, Benjamin Franklin and the things that he wrote and, and did, you know, discovering electricity. You can't observe that scientifically. You can't use the scientific method uh, to observe something or prove something through history. How do you prove something through history? Well, you prove it by eyewitnesses. Again, you prove history by documentation and eyewitnesses, not science. So when you hear the argumentation that we need science to prove the existence of God and also the resurrection of Christ, that's, that's not even something that would be asked today in any other area of study. Uh, the scientific method is for science, but if we want to prove historical accuracy, then we go back to eyewitnesses. We ask for this in every credible venture we have. Historians ask for this as well, that they have eyewitnesses. They write based on their own account of seeing or that of eyewitnesses. Uh, this is just plain common, common knowledge. So the Bible has an abundance of eyewitnesses. Again, 66 book books, over 40 different authors written on three different continents, a span of 1,500 years. So these authors really, most of them did not know each other and then written in three different languages. Yet everything is consistent. Everything lines up. Again, here's, here's, this is for validity, for you proving uh, the Bible when you are asked why you believe the Bible. So we have a collection in this 66 books of historical documents. When you enter into your apologetic of the Bible, of the resurrection of Christ, never, never go towards science because that's what the unbelieving world will want to take you toward. You, you need to go at this through a, a scientific methodology, but that's not how you prove history ever. <laughs> that's not ever how history has been proved. So again, we go through eyewitnesses and historical documentation. We also have historical documentation outside the Bible, extra biblical. Uh, this is from Josephus. Uh, Josephus lived uh, a few decades after Christ, a few short decades after Christ. So he was in the same time span, uh, more or less. There were people alive that had seen the risen Christ in the lifetime of historian Josephus. And I want to share with you what Josephus wrote about Christ. Josephus, the historian, writes, At this time there was a wise man called Jesus. And his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after the crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders, as the tribe of Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day. So again, Josephus, not in the Bible, this is a first century historian 
and he's writing about what was seen by eyewitnesses, what was perceived by those that were giving the account in the time of his life. And he was basically marveling, saying, these Christians were persecuted because of this Christ. These many believers, as Paul said, hundreds of them can account to this. And Josephus is saying at the end of his quote, the amazing thing is that they are not departing from what they learned and their love and discipleship of Christ. And ironically, they were being persecuted during this time. If this was a lie, if this was something made up, if this was something that was not perceived by eyewitnesses, why would anybody be willing to die for a lie? And they were standing firm, and Josephus again writes, And the tribe of Christians, so named after him, that is Christ, has not disappeared to this day. This was an amazement to Josephus. The Bible is internally consistent. We can't know God apart from His Word. So going back to the thrust of our study, why is it important to study the Bible? Why is it important to be in it daily? Because we cannot know God apart from our Word. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. Many people at, at Foothills know this is one of my soapbox arguments. But God doesn't speak through any means other than His Word. You'll hear people all over the place. You'll hear secularist, and you'll even hear many professing believers claim that God is speaking to them. Well, if that's true, if God is speaking to anybody today, then what He says to them needs to be added to the canon of Scripture, because every word from God is just as authoritative. We only adhere to what is written in the Word of God. Uh, an example of this, again, let's go back to Joseph Smith, who wrote the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith says that God spoke to him and gave him a revelation. Yet his teachings are heretical and they contradict the Word of God. So you see, we can't go and say, well, God is speaking to us. God doesn't speak through any means other than His Word. And for anyone to say that is to basically say that the Word of God's not enough, that we need more outside of the Bible than was written to us. No, rather the Word of God is fully sufficient, fully truthful, and it is impossible to know God outside of His Word. Now, furthermore, it's impossible for anyone to have salvation outside of the Word of God. We can't be saved through watching good works of others. Uh, you hear many times uh, some believers will say that, well, I, I don't preach and I don't uh, talk about Jesus. I just live my faith and God works through that. Well, well, honestly, God bless them, but that's the silliest thing that, that I've ever heard because in Romans chapter 10, Paul writes, how is anybody going to be saved? How will anyone believe without someone preaching to them? There's a supernatural element to the Word of God that we have forgotten many times in the modern day church, and that is that when we read the Word of God, it is the Word, it is the spoken Word of Christ that brings life into the heart of the unbeliever. So the Word of God is the only thing that can save. We can't save people by being good examples because then we would be able to say that we saved them. My actions saved them. Uh, I've said many times that no one's going to act a, a watch us doing acts of good, which we are called to do, but no one that is an unbeliever is going to watch a Christian do good things and say, you know what? I need Jesus. I need to bow the knee to Christ. I am a sinner. Uh, I am deserving of hell, but I need His grace upon me. No, you can't see the gospel. You can't hear the gospel unless we, we expound the Word of God to them. So it's important to remember that as believers, we are called to be a royal priesthood. Again, why, why is it important to read the Bible? Because we have a responsibility to be a royal priesthood and speak the Word of God, not our own opinion, not our own experience, not tell people how we were brought up or how Jesus changed my life and He can do the same for you. Now again, that is a true thing. We, we believe that, but that's not going to hold water with an unbeliever. We enter into the Word of God. As one pastor said, uh, the Word of God is our sword. You don't enter a sword fight without your sword. You don't lay the Bible down uh, against an unbeliever and say, well, I'm going to set aside the Word of God and convince you why Jesus exists. No, we can't do that. We don't ever lay aside our sword. Uh, the Word of God is what we fight this spiritual battle with. And lastly, knowing God's will is impossible apart from the Word of God. God doesn't speak again through any other means except for through His Word. He has spoken once and for all, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. There was a time that God spoke through prophets and through dreams in different ways, but in the end times and the end times began with the resurrection of Christ. In these end times, God has spoken 
through His Word once and for all. We have the complete and errant, infallible, historically documented Word of God. We need nothing else to stand firm on the faith, proclaim what we believe, be evangelistic, and to shout to the rooftops the glory of Jesus Christ. I'll end with this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I pray that we hold high, hold high the Word of God. I pray that we understand the importance of being saturated in the world of, Word of God. Uh, and also, I pray that this morning, if you haven't already, you've been given a little bit of a defense of the faith and how to combat that argument uh, that you will, if you are a believer here, from the unbelieving world. Why is it that you believe the Bible? Not depend on, on fleshly argumentation such as, well, I just believe it because of, of who I am or how I was raised or my experience. No, that we can show them that we know God through the, the historical documentation of God speaking through fallible men. So the Bible was written by men. You hear the, the argument again uh, sometimes that says uh, yeah, we can't trust the Bible because it was written by men. Well, if you believe that, you need to throw out all of your books and never read a newspaper or internet article again. If that's your argumentation that you can't believe the Bible. Yes, the Bible was written by men, but it was written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit and carried along by what they wrote. So again, God's Word is truthful, it's infallible, written by men, but inspired and led by God the Holy Spirit. I do pray this has been edifying for you and helpful. Uh, in your walk with the Lord and knowing that the Bible is something that we should gravitate towards every day of our life if we are to be lights in a dark world. At this time, let's bow our head and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that we would not neglect it. I pray, Lord, that we would not begin to see it as common, or something that we just pick up on Sunday mornings or maybe Wednesday nights, Lord, but it is the governing book of our lives, that in everything that we do, it carries us, it guides us. And as Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. I pray that would become a reality to us, that apart from Christ, we cannot exist, we cannot function in the world today. And we're seeing what happens when people are apart from the knowledge of God, apart from Christ. It ends in chaos, it ends in subjectivity, and it ends in destruction. I pray, Lord, that we as believers who hold the biblical worldview, the orthodox truth, the only truth that exists in the world today, that we would be passionate to proclaim this. It would be a heart cry of ours to take the gospel to our family, friends, nations even, Lord. And our defense would always be rooted in truth, history, and the inerrant, infallible Word of God. We thank you so much for everything you give us. It's in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.